Welcome everybody uh, to Do We Need to Rethink Innovation, uh, hosted by Chatham House. I'm Gian Volpicelli, I'm a senior editor at Wide UK and I will chair today's panel discussion. But let's start. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I work at Wide UK and at Wide we report a lot on how science, emerging technologies and new ideas in general are changing our world and shaping our future. Um, innovation uh, defined as a new method, idea, product that solves a problem or meets a need in a new way and it's more efficient than existing alternatives. Innovation is our bread and butter. Uh, and here's one interesting thing I've noticed when reporting on innovation, which is that very often when we tell stories about innovation, we like to focus on individuals having ideas, uh, exceptional founders, plucky teams, coming up with big eureka moments that change everything forever. Uh, and that is often how the world at large has understood innovation over the past decade and a bit, uh, as an act of titanic genius. Uh, founders have nighttime intuitions, uh, make high stake gambits and reap unexpected triumphs. Uh, this is essentially the Silicon Valley startup way of thinking about innovation, which is also the one that possibly holds most sway right now. But uh, there is certainly something to that version of understanding innovation, but that's not the be all and end all of it. Uh, and that narrative is increasingly being challenged by thinkers and policymakers who underline that innovation is not just a solo ideation act, uh, especially when we're talking about atoms and not only bits. Um, the kind of innovation that has the most impact is delivered by a, a plurality of actors working in concert, startups, of course, but also universities, investors, corporations, and governments that work all together to deliver something at scale. So this is being increasingly challenged. I'm, I'm just thinking, for instance, about the work of Mariana Mazzucato, but also in a way that kind of narrative, that kind of change of narrative is shaping some of the plans of, um, people in government. I'm thinking, for instance, also about Dominic Cummings, uh, former number 10 chief strategist, Dominic Cummings' plan to, um, to launch a UK ARPA, which sort of harkens back that to, to that idea. Um, and now COVID is, of course, forcing us to rethink what innovations really mean. So we are going to explore exactly all these questions today, whether we should be rethinking what innovation is, how we also tell uh, what innovation is, how we think about it, how we narrate it. Uh, we are going to see and check whether the lone founder myth still has some validity, so it still has some utility. And also we're going to try and explore how all the parties involved this in innovation can sort of work together, especially in these challenging times to to meet today's most pressing challenges. Um, so we are going to explore that, as I said, with four amazing speakers. First of all, Bernice Lee, Research Director of Futures at Chatham House. Andre Hoffman, Vice Chairman of the Board at Hoffman LaRoche Limited. Sarah Hunter, the Director of Global Public Policy at X. And Jeff Carbeck, CEO of 10X. Well, uh, I probably start from Bernice. Um, do you want to sort of explain us whether we should, I mean, what, what is the kind of rethinking of innovation we should have in these days? Are we thinking innovation all wrong? Or sh shall we change the way we talk about it? What do you make of all this? Well, thank you very much, Jan, for the introduction. And also on behalf of the Hoffman Center at Chatham House, I would like to welcome everybody as well to this webinar. I mean, as you mentioned rightly, that our society today worships and reveres innovation and innovators. And your magazine, Wired Magazine, is in fact a living shrine in some ways to the cult of innovation and innovators itself, which I'm a big fan of. Now, having said this, we have this image of an innovator as a swashbuckling warrior armed with an amazing idea that takes us all the way from beginning till delivering us the goods in the market. Now, but of course, the cold reality is that not only does it take a village, not just one brilliant lone warrior, it also 
is in, bound down to a blueprint that could get you from great idea or ideation to diffusion. And that along this journey from ideation to markets takes many different stages of learning by doings and iterations. And the journey is often far from linear. About a decade ago, I wrote a report with my colleague, former colleagues, Felix Preston and Ilian Ilyev, and we looked at about 45,000 clean energy patents or patents. And we looked at six different sectors. And there are a couple of learnings actually from that report that I think is actually quite relevant still for the discussion today. But well, first of all, it took about 20 years we measured in across about six different clean energy sectors for an idea to enter the patent system to becoming widely diffused. Now, not only does it take that long, 20 years is a long time in modern day in some ways, but it also takes a village, not just from a village, but from many different villages. It's just like solar energy being one example. In solar's case, we're talking about a technology that came from companies that made cameras, that made satellites, that made materials from Japan, from Australia. And they took that together with venture capital in California, investment in China with a large manufacturing capability, but more importantly, perhaps feed-in tariffs from Europe, Spain, and also Germany, where there isn't even any sunshine to kickstart this solar revolution that we see today that has led to dramatic cost reduction across the world many, many years later that we get into the point where we can say that it's getting to the mass market. Now, this dynamic that it took a village from many parts of the world and an open rules-based trading system to deliver the good isn't only relevant to the energy sector. Another one of my favorite example is that of the build material. And one of my favorite startup, which makes the zero carbon, zero heat made build material is one called Biomason by this CEO, Ginger Dossier. Now, the really amazing thing about this company is that even though it has a promise of a great material, and you mentioned Dominic Cummings in UK ARPA, Indeed, she may get a contract from DARPA in the, in the UK, US sense, the Department of Defense, to make self-curing cement underwater as a pilot. But it's much, much harder, however, for them to get a contract with an incumbent company, whether it's Lafarge Hosim or others, in order to test the materials. Now, why, does, why you may ask, which, would this amazing founder need this particular material? And the answer to the question is that, well, actually, Oftentimes, if you're making things in the real world, not just in the digital universe, things that people are going to use, live in, eat, etc. not that we eat cement, obviously, it means that you actually need to make sure that you have a strong compliance regime and you need to have lots of regulations in many different countries that you need to test. And this means that established companies are often actually very well placed to manage that process of getting a product from ideation to markets, especially because they have all the connections, both downstream and upstream with the suppliers, but also to the consumers and also knowledge of the regulatory uh, setup that actually would make it much easier for a particular product to reach markets, especially when scaling is the goal. Now, this is not only a problem because we need the, the, for those with the know-how in scaling to be part of the game, but also means that in so doing, you are competing with the business model of an incumbent in those companies. Now, let me find maybe one more example. Let me, so we've talked about energy sector, we talked about the build materials. How about agriculture and food tech? A couple of years ago, I did a lot of work on ag tech and food tech and including a particular discussion I'm thinking about where we co-hosted a meeting in California with the VC. And we were discussing at the time whether or not they would be setting up an accelerator. And of course, at the end of the day, they decided, well, actually perhaps not now, why not? The reason is because they were looking for sectors that actually have very low cost of replication and almost zero barrier to entry. Now, in the real world, as I said, if you're making stuff that you sit on, you eat, you put in your body, you sit on, perhaps it is very difficult to imagine a world where there is zero barrier to entry and very low cost of replication. So we're talking about a competition, not just with other stuff in your own sector, but also with other sector where they may have different kinds of systems. So this is... All of these reasons are the reasons why we must not only focus on incentives for innovation, which we now know are different from incentives for diffusion. And that means that we must invest in that village and that village that would actually get us from ideation to diffusion of the sort that we know 
we need. Now, let me just finish on one point on my favorite topic, climate change. This also means that if we want to make sure that we get the right technologies to be in play, and we have about a 20 years time frame and a village to build on top of everything else, if we don't start now, the technologies that we need may not be ready for the time when we want, would like to go net zero by a certain date, whether 2040, 2050, or 2060. Thank you. Over back to you, Jian. Uh, thank you, Bernice. Andre, do you want to pipe in and tell us what you think, whether it takes a village or in general, whether we should sort of reinterpreting what innovation means right now and how we should think about it? Unmute yourself, though. Thank you very much, Jan. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Yeah, it's very, um, um, it's a very topical subject, and it's a subject we really need to spend some time on. What, what is, um, what, what, what is innovation, and how does it work? I can talk about this in, uh, uh, in general terms. I can talk about this in the term of the uh, pharmaceutical industry, and in particular in the COVID light. I, I can start by telling you that um, our family company, uh, Hoffman La Roche, is a company which is very strongly focused on innovation. We've always defined ourselves as being in the business of innovation more than in the business of health. In fact, we've given ourselves the, the motto, doing today what the patient needs tomorrow, which strikes me as being um, uh, a little bit obsolete in today's condition, because what we should be saying really is uh, doing today what the patient needs today, because the, the epidemic has changed, or the pandemic now, has changed quite a number of um, consideration in terms of time. Now, um, if we're looking at, um, at um, uh, the conditions for innovation, what are the conditions needed for innovating rapidly? And there again, and I will come back to this, this notion of the pandemic has helped us to focus in a way which we did not really expect to happen so quickly. I mean, the, the purpose for innovating healthcare uh, is, 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 um, is always going to be the same one. It's to discover therapeutic solutions for unmet medical needs. And this is something we've been practicing for a while. However, um, the, 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 the current trends are accelerating greatly and the current trends are quite simple. I, I would list four, if I may. Um, uh, the speed, how do we quickly go to the market? Um, you know, uh, as a very simple example, um, uh, the, the vaccine for the current pandemic has taken eight months to develop. It's never happened before in less than eight years. So you can see the ratio. I mean, uh, speed is increasing. Secondly, it's very much based on knowledge sharing. Now that's something that um, we've been trying to distribute since a long time in, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, getting sure that people have access to the, to the same information points at the same time. It's not been easy because of competition issues. A lot of companies have decided that they would prefer to keep some information proprietary rather than sharing it. COVID has changed that. Today, we really do have cross-company collaboration. Um, it, it goes all the way to even sharing manufacturing capacities, and I'll go back to that a little bit later. So a lot of the bottlenecks of individual companies have been removed. So uh, you, you, can, you can look at that in terms of collaboration as well. Um, uh, we've all understood that uh, we would emerge from that crisis quicker, faster, leaner, uh, in a fitter condition if we collaborate, rather than if we um, uh, continue to see people, not only uh, competitors, but also see people in the nonprofits, government and regulatory environment, the FDA, the, the EMEA, as, as people who are um, uh, and, um, stopping us to innovate rather than helping us to innovate. And I think this, um, this collaborative mindset um, as an attitude has been, has been very helpful to help us in the whole ecosystem, the whole life science ecosystem. We at Roche have been champions for quite a long time of something which we call um, uh, personalized healthcare. Personalized healthcare requires a huge amount of data. And that, I think, would be my third point about what um, uh, innovation is all about. Today, a new technology push has very much to do with artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence expresses itself mostly in um, the use of data and the regular use of, of, of data sets. Now, these data sets in the health industry have always been very difficult to get to. Um, I always say that the local uh, retailer knows more about me than my doctor does because of my, 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 my shopping habits, because of my habits at, at uh, using credit cards for payment, etc. Uh, we in, still consider healthcare data as being so uh, private that we cannot really use them for, 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 for the system, but only for individuals, which I think is, is, is probably an opportunity missed, and I'm looking forward to this changing. 
we would need, in fact, two, two, two blocks of, of data. We would need the data from the studies and patients. Now, at the moment, there are lots of studies running in the COVID um, uh, infection, and some of these data would probably give us teachings about other type of infections, and it would be a, a, a pity to waste that. So I hope we will be able to get to an agreement where the whole ecosystem will allow us to use this. And then, of course, we, we have invested heavily in digital technologies. In fact, we've gone as far as creating a new division of our business. We used to be just a business uh, focusing on pharma and diagnostics, so uh, machines which will help us to identify the biomarker which characterizes a disease, as long as producing the molecule which will help us to deal with this disease. Nowadays, we realize that um, Nowadays, I mean, it's quite recent, you know, uh, we've realized that the amount of data generated by both activities could be put together into a, into a division which will help us to get some insights into what, what, how we should treat uh, diseases in general. And I think that's where the future of healthcare actually is. Now, perhaps I can give you a couple of examples that are specifically linked to COVID. And I would like to take two out. Um, uh, one is about manufacturing capacities. I was talking about manufacturing capacities before. Um, uh, the, the way to deal with some of these infection, infectious diseases is to use antibodies. Now, uh, the immune system uh, produces antibodies when it is confronted to an infection. You could boost the immune system by either uh, producing a vaccine, which a number of our, of our co-worker in the industry have done. We have preferred to concentrate on self onto injecting antibodies. And we've partnered with an American company called Regeneron, which are producing monoclonal antibodies. So antibodies which have been cloned, but cloned in a specific manner, um, to inject into patients at an early stage. I'm sorry that I have to say that some of uh, the leaders of the American administration have benefited from this, from this um, uh, treatment, which is, of course, a, um, uh, should be available to everybody, but at the moment, because of cost consideration, isn't. Uh, we have the biggest manufacturing capacity in monoclonal antibodies because of our activity in oncology, and we've made that available to an American company called General, where we're producing this cocktail. And this cocktail has been very effective in treating patients. Perhaps, if you allow me the, the parenthesis, I should sort of take the opportunity to say that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the pandemic has increased innovation and has helped a lot of people to go closer to a solution but it has been at a humongous cost. I mean, millions of people have lost their lives, and I think we should never really forget that. Uh, big transitions happen in extraordinary circumstances, and we're having an extraordinary circumstance in front of us. So I don't know if there are people listening to us today who have been exposed to the consequence of the virus, but if that's the case, please um, accept my sympathy. Um, closing the parenthesis. Uh, the, the, next, the, the next type of activities we, we, we have, um, got involved in is um, testing. How can we identify what the virus actually is and how can we characterize it? We've been able to produce the first antigen text six weeks after the publication of uh, the genetic code of the virus. Uh, that's absolutely um, enormous, but it's only a very small part of the, 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 the opportunity. The opportunity is, of course, manufacturing these tests in huge quantities. And there as well, we have increased our, our production factor in the last three months by 70 times, not 70%, 70 times every, uh, every second month. And that's uh, something which uh, has required a lot of, uh, of push from a lot of people. Great. Uh, at the moment, just the last sentence. At the right. Moment, we have 10 uh, seconds. Okay. <laughs> at the moment, we, we are also entering into this uh, collaboration with Moderna, testing one of the vaccines to be able to really identify the amount of antibody quantities into the patient they are treating, thereby producing not only uh, help to, to, the, to, to the, the therapy of the patient, but also identifying what the characteristic of the pandemic is so that we can treat better, uh, the patients better later on. Sorry, that's what I want to say, John. Thank you. Uh, let's proceed to Sarah uh, from X, uh, which is one of my, from Silicon Valley, I suppose, one of the sanctums of innovation. So, Sarah, please uh, tell us whether we have been thinking about innovation wrong and whether we should rethink it from the current era or whether we should just stay course, stay the course, and, and that's it. Uh, thanks, Jan. And uh, yeah, I am. I do work in Silicon Valley, although currently in the UK. So uh, an interesting bridging position here. Um, so for those who don't know who we are, I just I'll explain a little bit about X, and that will maybe uh, anchor my perspective on this topic. Um, so X is a sister company to Google. We were Google X, and now we're just X. 
And we look for new technologies and scientific breakthroughs to solve big problems. So we were the team, we've been around for 10 years. We were the team that launched self-driving cars, the first team in the world to work on self-driving cars. Um, and the idea is that we come up with innovation, we incubate it within X for an, you know, a number of years, and then we launch it as a new business for Alphabet. So Waymo is now an independent business. Um, and we've worked on all kinds of things, all sectors, from aviation to biotech to agriculture. And so that starting point, I think, might explain why I'm here, because from the outside, you'd think that I just care about the breakthrough innovation, the sort of traditional view of the Silicon Valley innovator. But actually, I'd start by saying I agree with uh, what the previous speakers have said. And I think it's a really welcome conversation. You know, the term innovation uh, is now a sort of strap line to every organization in the world. Like, you know, the most boring corporates claim to be innovators. Uh, and actually, it's uh, th this sort of uh, mis uh, genericizing of the, of the word, I don't think is helpful to anyone because I agree with Bernice. There is, uh, it's a continuum, right? There's a sort of initiation of idea, there's a prototyping, there's a testing, and then there's a scaling. And all of those are innovative in their own ways, but they are all different and they require different approaches. Um, so at X, we focus on that earlier stage uh, prior to scaling. But even within that context, um, I would agree with a lot of the things Bernice saying. For example, uh, we absolutely need to work in the real world. There's no bit of the uh, innovation process that enables you to do it all in the lab with one extraordinary genius. I think that's a myth. Um, and actually, even from Silicon Valley perspective, I don't think it's a fair representation of what true breakthrough innovation requires. From our perspective, we find the most innovative teams uh, and the teams that develop the ideas that actually work in practice often are the most diverse teams. So we try and create teams which are um, diversity of background, but also diversity of mindset. We put physicists together with, uh, you know, sociologists. There's a, there's a real um, breakthrough conversation that happens when you bring together those different yet complementary skill sets. Um, but we also think that you need to have a toleration for risk. And this is something that actually at that later stage, that scaling stage is, is often not the most comfortable thing that big companies and big organizations are able to do. When you're working at the early stage of innovation, being ready to fail, accepting that nine of your ideas are not gonna work in order for one of them to work is culturally very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for everyone, um, but we believe it's a really fundamentally important part of breakthrough innovation. Um, so we are, if you like, cultural engineers, we try and create circumstances where embracing the reality of failure is something that you are ready to do time and time again. Um, and I do think that's one of the interesting fact features that has, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, that's one of the most interesting features of the last year, as Andre was saying, that actually have, have generated this innovation, which is that the tolerance for risk globally has been much higher because people are dying and because we are having to work in different ways in a race against time. So I do think that toleration for risk and failure is something that breakthrough innovation really does, needs and isn't so great at the later stages of the scaling innovation. I'll stop there. I'll, I could talk about all of this, but I'll, I'll leave it to uh, to the next speaker to carry on the conversation. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Um, well, Jeff, you, you are the last of our speakers. Do you want to weigh in on, on the grounds of all that has been said before you? So you have a great opportunity to contradict everyone without any <laughs> retort. Exactly, although I do see we have another you know, 30 minutes or so. Um, a couple of things. So first of all, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to thank, um, you know, Jen, you for, for hosting this together with uh, the panelists here and Chatham House and also in, in particular to Bernice uh, for, for co-authoring an article, an opinion piece that appeared this month in Wired UK, I guess it's actually in the January issue that was sort of the impetus for this. And it came out of a, a dialogue we've been having over over a year now about, you know, some of the sacred cows of innovation and, and how, how can we think about making innovation work better by maybe getting rid of some of these ideas or overcoming them. So uh, I think it's been a fascinating uh, journey and I, I'm very appreciative of that. Um, you know, I think about this topic in a simplistic way um, as sort of an innovation supply chain and I've kind of lived that supply chain. I've spent the first third of my career in academia as a professor, 
discovering and inventing. I spent the middle third of my career uh, taking those kinds of inventions and ideas and trying to build startups and businesses out of them. And I've spent the most recent third of my career uh, at Deloitte and now at 10X advising large companies on how to think about building new businesses enabled by these ideas that are uh, in principle flowing from universities through startups and then into um, large organizations. And I, the more I've spent time in that area, the more I realize that that's actually not how it typically works. And I think we've spent a lot of time trying to focus on collaboration and think about how do we make that process of you know, discovery at the university, um, development at a startup and then scale at, at, at large companies work. And I think um, there've been some fabulous examples of where that is successful. And I think you know, the pharmaceutical industry is the best example of that. And I think part of the reason is because that model is understood from the beginning. So if somebody in a university discovers a new molecule or a new tool for, for uh, doing uh, diagnostics, uh, the, the connections between pharma and um, venture capital and, and the startup uh, environment happens very early. And everybody understands the game, everybody understands where the value is, and I think everybody understands the regulatory environment. And so it works. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case um, when we look at other places, and I'm still talking about, you know, hard tech innovation. So Adams, not just bits, as, as you said, uh, Gian, I think that's, that's a really important distinction. Um, and that's the world I come from, where we try and take new manufacturing technologies, new materials to market. And the issue is, is that it takes at least 20 years to do that. And more than 90% of those efforts fail, even once they've been funded by venture capital. And we need to do better. We have to accelerate that. We need, we need better um, uh, opportunities to take those technologies forward for the big challenges that we face that I think we all understand here. And so, you know, what, what, what might be needed? You know, I think there are three things or three ideas we should think about. So I think, I think startups are a very powerful uh, mechanism for innovation, but they can only do a certain piece of it. And rather than expecting them to, um, you know, suddenly find a, a strong collaborative uh, corporate partner after being funded for five plus years. Um, maybe we should think about other types of funding mechanisms that actually uh, put some of the money from say governments that have gone into the front end part of uh, research into more downstream types of scaling. So I think that's one area where you need to look. I think the second area we need to look at is around um, ways of these large uh, corporate incumbents as we're referring them to, to get back to in some sense what they were doing 50 years ago, 70 years ago. I mean, if you visited GE's corporate research lab in the middle of the 20th century, you know, you'd meet a guy like Irving Langmuir who won the Nobel prize in chemistry, but who was working on things like, how do you make light bulbs last longer and be more efficient? Or how do you make uh, new kinds of detergents that um, make clothes cleaner and, and surfaces cleaner and safer? We just don't have that today, right? We don't have people with that intellect inside of companies who actually have as their mandate to, to drive commercialization. And so we need to think about different types of structures um, within large companies that can make that happen. And I think the third and last thing I'll mention, and uh, you know, uh, Sarah brought it up as well. Uh, I think actually all of our, our panelists have brought it up at some level, you know, we need better coordination and understanding of regulation. Many times regulation is ultimately what drives true innovation in these, in these sectors whether it's you know, investments uh, and mandates by government and solar, whether it's what we're seeing now, electric vehicles. I mean, the whole field of, of um, battery innovation is being driven by government mandated um, deployment of electric vehicles. And, and that's gonna continue to happen and needs to continue to happen, but we need better coordination. So I think if we can think about those three topics, then we can start to really get at this issue of acceleration and, and improvement in the, in the success rate of bringing these technologies forward into the market and having the impact that we need. So thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, well, we already have several questions from the audience. But before we start with the question from the audience, I'd like to ask you actually a question from myself. Uh, to all of you, uh, possibly Bernice has strong ideas about it, but I wonder whether the conversation we're having is mostly a question of narratives. Uh, so should we just, I mean, because you gave several examples of the kind of uh, innovation you think we need more of already happening. And there are some uh, corporate labs like possibly X itself where the kind of um, 
great innovation Jeff just suggested to us now is also happening. So I wonder whether all this conversation about how COVID changes with the way we think about innovation is just about really about narrative, about changing the way we think about it, but in a way just spotlighting something that hasn't been spotlighted in the last few years, but was still go going on in some ways. What do you think? Maybe Bernice can kick off, but I would like to hear from all of you because I think all of you have great points to add to this. Well, thank you for that, Jan. I think that obviously, you know, a lot of these ideas have been around, a lot of the challenge around the cult of innovation has been around for a long time. But of course, what we are seeing right now is that COVID is becoming this boiling pot that we are really thinking about whether or not the frogs are getting out of the, of the, of the pot. And therefore, it is now time to really think about some of these large challenges. I mean, the other day I was hosting a different discussion for Chatham House and we were chatting about how well COVID is creating new business opportunities and job opportunities because people are now thinking about obviously work very differently. And then I think I even talked to you about this, Jan, the other day. That what do we do now nowadays? We talk at our computer in a room on our own day and night. Now, we will have to think about how to do work differently in the future if we're going to make this interesting. So this is a long way of saying that it is a question of necessity as much as it is about narrative that will drive some of these shifts. So it, in addition to narrative, we're seeing necessity really becoming an important driver. And we, the panel has already talked about risk tolerance, evolving risk tolerance being one such factor, but also others are more cognizant, more understanding around the need across the whole innovation chain for things to be pushed from ideation to markets. So it's both really, it's a narrative, but also necessity and hopefully knowledge and therefore more collaborative, innovative system investments. Thank you. Uh, does uh, no, uh, Andre, Sarah, Jeff, do you have one yeah. to weigh in? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let's start with Andre and then Sarah. Sorry, thank you very much, Dan. No, for, for, for me, and uh, you know, the, the narrative, the conversation has completely changed with the eruption of this virus. Uh, so, suddenly, we, we, you know, we've had crisis before. We had the climate crisis, absolutely evident. We had, you know, five years of Paris Accord. We, we, we had the biodiversity loss, absolutely evident. Less and less species. The, the WWF Living Planet Report showing 60% or nearly two thirds of the of the invertebrate species having disappeared over the past 50 years, etc., etc., etc. Why are we suddenly taking them much more seriously? Why are we taking suddenly a much more open attitude towards innovation? It's because we are scared. And, scare, and you know, scaring is something that didn't really happen in these in this realities before. The eruption of health in the public debate is ph phenomenally important. Uh, until now, it was considered as being something not too important. If you lose it, you know, the, 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 the monkeys in the Amazon, who cares? But now, suddenly, in our bathroom, in our bedroom, in our, in our drawing rooms, there is a possibility of us catching a virus which might kill us. And I think that is the biggest accelerator I can think of. Now we're really changing the story. We cannot uh, invent excuses for not encouraging innovation in a broader sense. And I think that has changed the game completely. Yeah, I, I would I'll double down that, but I'd also say I see this as a sort of actually more about climate. So I think before this year, there was a sort of meta conversation about we're heading towards a global meltdown and yet we're not acting. Like there was a sort of like, why is it that we are allowing this to happen? And then COVID came along and it showed us we can act, we can transform how we perform in our economy, how we behave at home, like this great sort of unknown about climate, will people ever change their behavior? Well, guess what? We have in the last year really rapidly and actually found some things that we quite like about this new way of working, you know, not working, you know, away from home, traveling all the time. Like some people uh, are realizing that actually change is not all bad, change can be good as well. So I actually see this as a sort of, um, a, a realization that the kind of change we need for climate to tackle the climate crisis is possible. My worry, my, my sort of big question is, I'm not seeing big changes in investment and behavior around that at a sort of corporate or, or, or big investor level. You know, this tolerance for risk, this willingness to have things not work all the time, that is not the mindset of most big organizations. And I think that is what we need if we're gonna tackle the climate crisis. And this is what we did because we were scared of dying with COVID. So I do think that's, that's the next change. Just quickly about it for one second. 
I, I would like to just give you the example of the Paris Accord. Five years ago, when we signed the Paris Accord, it was science fiction. Nobody really believed it. Government paid it, the signed it, but corporation did not believe in it. Today, it is reality. Every single major corporation on the planet is coming out with a plan for 2050 new zero carbon. That's amazing. And that uh, contradicts what Sarah was just saying, and I'm sorry that I did this. Right. Um, one, one question that I'm seeing uh, coming from the audience, I think in a way links pretty nicely with what we had just finished discussing is about the role of governments in sparking innovation. And more specifically, it's about whether do you think government will continue to subsidize uh, innovation, partner with private sector companies after uh, the current successes with, uh, with vaccines? Uh, or whether we risk like losing the momentum and going back uh, to like to pre 2020 in a way and back to uh, think about innovation as a sort of plucky startup versus the world uh, kind of uh, business. What do you think? Maybe Jeff, you can start because you haven't uh, answered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, you know, and I, I mentioned this a little bit in my opening remarks. You know, I think that um, government has a huge um, you know, hugely powerful position to drive innovation in certain directions, right? And I mean, to Andre's point about the Paris Accord, um, you know, it give these kinds of um, uh, statements and mandates give very clear sort of marching directions, but the question is still, how do you get there? And, and I guess this is my concern about all of the pledges that, that corporations are making around the, 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 the Paris Accord or where they want to be at 2050. It's great to say you want to be you know, carbon neutral or carbon negative. If you then say, well, what are all the technologies that I actually need to achieve that? It's quite overwhelming. It's a much bigger challenge than developing a vaccine, which is a huge accomplishment. But I think, um, you know, A, those narratives are important as exactly as Sarah said, because it gives us ideas about how, how to do this, right? It's not just that we have an ambition and a goal, but it's how do we get there? How do we you know, reduce the time from you know, years to months for a vaccine and, and what lessons there are, are transferable? And I think there needs to be an, um, an activity that sits above the commercial level that um, focuses on those kinds of questions and thinks about how, how goals can be reduced to regulations that drive more near-term activities and behaviors to actually start to get us to where we need to be. Uh, I don't know, Sarah, uh, Sarah or Bernice or Andrea, yeah. do you want to? I, Sarah, I, um, I, uh, I think governments are crucial here and, I, and I'm a big fan. I mean, I think someone's already, you mentioned Jan, Mariana Mazzucati. I'm a big fan of her work and the, and the role that governments can and should be playing as sort of orchestrators of mission-driven innovation. Like it's, we all agree that there's a sort of end-to-end -end massive task to be done. That it's only governments really who can play that role as the sort of orchestrators of public and private sector. But it does require them to take a leadership role in an area which I think a lot of them are very nervous is, is electorally quite unpopular. Um, so I think it's inherent in all of us to sort of step up and say, look, it is possible to do. Here are the technologies. You're, you're right, Jeff. There's there's a litany of things that needs to be done. If you just look at agriculture, for example, you know, 30% of our carbon is agriculture and there's still tons of breakthrough innovations that are required, let alone before we get to the scaling side of things. So I think there is a role for innovation. I think actually it's interesting, one of the, you know, you wouldn't think that Tony Blair and Dominic Cummings would agree about much, but the one thing they both agree on is that there should be an ARPA. And I think actually look at what ARPA did, DARPA did in the US and then uh, ARPA -E as well. Um, I think that sort of um, innovation-focused public agency is a really useful way to sort of legitimize the kind of failure-first, science-driven innovation that we do at X, and that I think actually the public sector should own again. Great. Well, I think, so, Andre, you go on. Yeah, Andre, go on. There's a very interesting point there, and that's this point of, um, uh, to, to, in order to restore the situation to some semblance of normality, and I don't mean just the pandemic, I mean the climate crisis, I mean the biodiversity loss, I mean the social systems uh, um, uh, outburst that we're having at the moment, we, we need to reintroduce a certain amount of entrepreneurship, we need to reintroduce a certain amount of creativity. And governments are notoriously not very good at that. So APA is a good example of an agency that has done that. But I, I would like to say that in the future, if we can master the, the, the innovation uh, drive of companies to be able to assume some of this responsibility, we could make a big change. And for that, there is a very simple problem. It's the accounting problem. 
At the moment, we report the performance of company only on financial metrics, and that doesn't correspond to reality. We need to be able to put in place an impact system, an impact measurement system, which would be industry agnostic and which would allow all us big businesses to continue to impact the system, but in a positive way. Because today, we've we already gone too far. We can no longer just say we do no harm. We have to actively uh, uh, be a net contributor to the state of the world. We have to invest into regenerative type of activities. And that will not happen if there's not an inbuilt incentive. And that inbuilt incentive has to do with accounting and performance measurement. So we need urgently an impact measurement system. I guess the digital minister of Taiwan would disagree with the fact that governments are not innovative, but let's ask Bernice what she thinks. I was just thinking, I agree actually with what's just been said that of course we need impact metrics next to risk metrics. And we also need governments to be much more aware that it is both an actor within the larger ecosystem as well as an investor in the larger ecosystem. Something that I think you're absolutely right that Mariana, for example, Ambassador Carter has written a lot and very persuasively about as well, that it is both an actor in itself, a driver of demand, but also an investor in incentives that could actually drive both demands. So I guess in a way, whether or not we would see the continuation post-pandemic of this sort of government role, industrial policy in different sectors would depend on how society perceived the success of government in driving both of these, both as an actor in itself but also as an investor in the broader ecosystem that could drive the technology that we know we need from obviously ideation to diffusion. One of the things that I always think about when it comes to ARPA and DARPA is that, as I used the example earlier on this underwater curation of cement, self-curation, self-curating cement example, is that it is very, very excellent at spotting stuff at the early stage. And then the question then is how many of them languish along the way as well through the system? And how do we make sure that actually that system drive us through not just the initial ideation, brilliant idea, piloting phase, but also in the scaling phase. And I think that that does require some more thinking in order to connect the dots from the beginning till the larger scaling procurement, et cetera, type of policy related incentives. Thanks. Actually, just to, just to build on what Bernice said, I mean, I think DARPA provided innovators with sort of their first price insensitive customer, right? The defense of the realm exactly. is a pretty big budget. And so actually you knew when you were building innovation that there was a customer, right? Who would pay a lot of money mm -hmm. for it. Similarly, in the, in the last year, the vaccine production, like lots of countries pre-bought, pre-ordered the vaccine, there, there was a, a reassuring a, a, a of the innovation process. And again, in the solar industry in Germany, that's how they stimulated the market. One of the ways they stimulated the market by saying, we will buy, we will promise you a price for that, that first wave. So again, ro the role of government as the sort of first customers, the procurer um, that will guarantee you their, your first market, I think is really important. And again, not often thought about when governments think about how do they stimulate innovation. Right. That's a great point, Sarah. I totally agree. And I think if you look at DARPA versus ARPA -E in the United States, I think DARPA was much better at transitioning technologies because they had that customer. And that's where ARPA -E definitely struggled great innovation came out or great discoveries and development came out of that, but there was nobody necessarily there to take it and, and be that first customer. And I think that's critical when you start to think about these kinds of uh, investments. Good. Unless you have anything else to add, I would probably shoot the next question, which is a great question. It's about semantics in a way. So for, this is from Nicholas Dungan, president of Cogito Praxis. He asks whether the panelists could address what they consider the purpose of innovation. Is it just about creating financial value? Is it about benefiting society? Is it just about doing something better? Uh, and how do we better measure the benefit of society if the answer is the second? Uh, I think it's pretty interesting, of course, uh, because it's, it goes back to the idea of hey, some startups are great at innovating stuff we don't really need, but Maybe you're not thinking about that when we think about innovation in this particular era. I don't know. Bernice, do you want to start? You already are muted, so. Well, I mean, in fact, I, what I may do is I'm sorry, I could also see some of the Q&A coming in, so I may try to combine some of them if I may. I think that clearly a lot of incentives for innovation, for example, such as the patent system that we talked about, were presupposing that there could be a contribution to society and in return that they get monopoly. 
for a certain period of time. And that was meant to be a reward for contribution to society. And the return is also that the quid pro quo is that you will also share the knowledge through the patent filing and et cetera. So there is you know, a lot of system, you know, a lot of a lot of the incentive system today, in addition to fame and glory and riches, is about societal contribution. So do I think that it should be about societal contribution? Of course I do think that it is about that. And I also believe that being a maximalist about these things, it is important that we line up all the incentives for all the relevant sectors in such a way that could actually deliver those. Having said that, I think there's a question from Maria, who is a wonderful innovator herself in sustainable aviation, in the stuff that she's been doing in Sweden and elsewhere. And you know, the reality is, you know, is that even if you have a need, you have a necessity that we know that we have no alternative really to short, you know, long distance air travel, for example, within the time frame. And it is not easy to drive all the way from there to having a solution, even though you know that there could be an impact. So now, why is it that for something that is such a clear rationale, we still can't? It's because we haven't quite lined up the risk and the impact metrics, metrics together in such a way that also align with financial value. So in a way, whether or not it's about societal value or not, we also need to make sure that it works in the real world. Fortunately, unfortunately, that actually does deliver finance benefit, financial benefits for those along the supply chain and along the innovation chain as well. Thank you. Who else wants to weigh in? Sarah, do you have anything to yeah, add I mean, regarding the purpose of innovation? Yeah, what's what's innovation supposed well, to achieve? There's lot, I mean, obviously, you know, if you're a company, then you can innovate and make lots more money. So like uh, the, my version of the kind of innovation I'm interested in is not everyone's, but at X, we require, I mean, we basically say, look, there's lots of technologies you could launch and you're in Silicon Valley. There's lots of, of sort of uh, business ideas out there, but we'll only work on things that are solving big problems in the world. And we require teams to have a focus on the public good. And it's not just because those are the kind of people who want to come and work at X. That's sort of our, our, our one of our values. It's also because we think that's the best kind of business to run. Like if you want to run a big business, you've got to be sure you're solving a problem in the world. Uh, that is the way to actually to, to, to have commercial success. So that that rigor about being focused on real problems, not just, you know, perceived sort of Silicon Valley problems, um, I think is is not just right. It's also quite smart. Yeah, agreed. I can't see anyone saying that they want to ignore it in order to make life worse. Andre, please. I would well, just I think. <laughs> very much the same issue. What's the purpose of, of, of innovation? For us, very specifically, it's saving lives. Our job is to mm. use medicine, which are, you know, uh, uh, therapeutic solution to unmet medical need. Last year, 121 million people across the planet have taken products that were either manufactured by us or discovered by us. We didn't cure them all, but we cured a lot of them. And so that, that's a purpose which allows us to recruit the best talent to come and work for us, but also uh, uh, allows us to motivate the, the, the innovation drive that we are constantly having. We are not interested in producing products that's been discovered somewhere else. We want to push our own discovery channel and want to make sure that we innovate healthcare. And we can do that not only on our own, but also in partnership with small industry. And uh, as you know, Sarah, we have um, Genentech in the Silicon Valley, where we are in constant competition with recruitment talent from other uh, companies in the Valley. And some of them come to us because they want to make a difference. And that difference is uh, in very real terms, saving lives. And so, yes, um, it's not a good idea to innovate in things that are futile, but as long as you get into the core of it, I think you, 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 we still have a, a big agenda Okay. Yeah, maybe just just to add, ahead, add a Jeff. quick word here. Yeah, I, you know, one, one of the things I've always struggled with is the idea that innovation is some sort of external activity. I mean, innovation is fundamental to the human condition, right? I mean, it's just about doing things differently to make things better. And I think that's what fundamentally mot motivates us as people. So as soon as we start to say, well, there's this thing out there called innovation, it's got this process and a blah, blah, blah. You, you create this distance and then it, I think it actually loses its, its, its power to a certain degree. And I mean, that was one of the things that we, we struggled with early on. We were saying, you know, the thing maybe we need to stop focusing on is innovation itself as this concept of something that's separate from us and recognize it's just the purpose of almost all of the organizations that we create and almost all of the things that we do as humans, whether it's around our own personal lives or as, whether it's part of a, of a massive corporation or government. And so, you know, I think understanding that and accepting that as just a part of the, the human condition, I think, is actually a really important mindset. Great. Uh, we are almost finished, but I think we can probably squeeze in 
one or two more questions. Uh, it's one that really caught my eye uh, from the audience. It's about risk tolerance. So how, I mean, of course we said that we are sort of rethinking innovation and we are ready to take much bolder gambits in order to solve the current crisis and essentially our tolerance for risk has increased. Uh, but how do companies, especially established companies, uh, deal with that kind of uh, risk of failure, especially when dealing with very complex and impactful technologies? Uh, and access accessory question is, how does that sort of square with very highly regulated environments, markets? So how do we manage risk in a highly regulated era? Well, can I perhaps just, just one sentence? Um, uh, you cannot innovate if you don't take risks. So if the, if the, if the risk environment is sort of de-risked by a regulation which allows you, which, which forbids you to, to take risk, then, you know, what's the purpose of it? So, so I think that's a sort of uh, semantic argument that you were describing before, Jim. You know, the, the idea, of, the, the question contains its own answer. We cannot mm. innovate without taking risks. Uh, let me just have a rejoinder there. Do you think that, uh, in a strange way, the, the, the smaller, plucky, one founder kind of ventures, like startups, are more risk tolerant in some cases? Uh, like, are they more, since they're less to lose in some in some cases, maybe just a couple of people with a laptop, maybe they're more ready to take risks as opposed to a big corporate entity. So, so there we go into this notion of a, a, ge a geographical difference. You know, the Silicon Valley, people take risks all the time. They're small companies, they go, they go bankrupt. If you haven't gone bankrupt at least twice, you will not get finance for your next joint, for, 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 for your next venture. In Europe, it's very different. If you fail, you fail, and you recognize as having failed. So the, the, this appetite for risk is, 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 a, is a very different one. But that's why uh, international corporation have to be able to pick up the two things. On the one side, you don't want a slapdash attitude of um, the Silicon Valley. On the other side, you don't want people to be scared of, of stepping out of the market. What you really want is people to be able to live their own values. You need to give them the environment where they can be themselves, where they can come with new ideas. And I think that's the job of big corporations. We need to be able to partner much more than we do at the moment. Okay. Anyone else wants to weigh in? Sarah, I see you are uh, Yeah, I mean, we, we, like, as I said at the beginning, trying to create an environment where risk and failure is not just okay, but what you're expected to do is super hard. Like, as, you know, from the, from the moment we're born, we're brought up to succeed, right? And so when you're told by your boss, no, 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 go do this and, and be okay with failure, go out of your way to ask yourself questions about, you know, whether or not this is going to work or not, and be okay with taking that step without knowing the answer. It's really hard to do. So we create all kinds of things within our company to incentivize people to do that. Like, we have... Uh, bonuses for teams that shut themselves down. We do pre-mortem. So before you launch a, an experiment, we sort of get people to run through what might go wrong. And I think sort of linking to, to Andre's business, the, we, we found that people who come from the scientific uh, disciplines are much more comfortable with this concept of experimentation and learning. So you reframe risk as a learning and you go out and ask the questions like, do we know the answer to this? No. Well, let's run to experiments and let's be happy with whatever the answer is. Um, but we have found that other, but that corporates generally find this really, really hard to do unless they create very bespoke um, learning environments, experimentation environments where, you know, they are not being judged on whether, how many things succeed, their, you know, rewards are not linked to success. Like there's all kinds of, of things you have to do to almost protect the experimentation process from being judged in that sort of traditional corporate way, because I, I think it is really hard to do in a normal company. Well, I mean, if I may, I mean, I think that ultimately, building on what Sarah and Andre and Jeff has just said as well, and you as well, Jan, that obviously too big to fail is not a good model, because that means that you don't take the right kind of risk. And in some ways, that points us to one of the biggest problems, which is the whole idea of business model risk, not just a technology risk, that in a way, you know, compared to a business model that has been optimized for hundreds of years, is difficult for a new idea to break through. And how do you, as Sarah mentioned, you know, in the context of X, create the innovation ecosystem within that actually encourage different types of mindset? It would strike me as being one such challenge that we would need to go. And now, never let a crisis go to waste is now obviously an extremely cliche thing to say, which is also true then we shouldn't really waste inertia because obviously inertia is itself another risk. 
that we get sucked into the inertia without breaking out with all the institutional barrier that that brings. So hopefully, as we move into the next level of thinking around what does it take to create a new, refreshed innovation ecosystem, more collaborative, more likely to deliver on societal goods, we will be mindful of all these different types of barriers that we need to slay in order that we get to the next level. Thank you. Jeff, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, no, I think I think Bernice really uh, captured it well in her comments. Um, you know, I think what we're fundamentally trying to do here is some deconstruction, right, of of uh, concepts to then open the, the 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 field up or the arena up for for thinking about new ways in which all of these drivers, including risk, intersect and and, and push a sort of new innovation model forward. So. Um, you know, I, I think that's really what we need to now be focused on, right? What, what do we do? What is our call to action? I think, um, you know, now that we are getting at some of the challenges that have prevented us from accelerating in the past, you know, what, 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 what's next? Right, we're almost done. I would have to ask you that very classical question of all panel discussions. So do you want to, each of you to give me a line about how do we innovate our own mindsets? How do we innovate our way of thinking so that you start uh, thinking about issues of opportunities related to innovation in more productive ways. Maybe let's start in the sort of order of appearance. Bernice, do you want to give me a few words about that? How to innovate our mindsets? Well, um, I think that we need to start by asking ourselves what are the sacred cows that we want to slay? because I think that stopping our own minds from stopping ourselves from innovating is perhaps one that asking us what are the things that we don't want to give up. So we'll start with that. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm muted, I'm muted. Uh, Andre, do you want to <laughs> comment? Well, Bernice caught me short because she was very short and I expected her to be very long. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think Pithy. that's... If you, know, if you really want to shift your mindset into innovation, you have to accept to live in, in, in uncertainty. And that's something that doesn't come naturally to people. The biggest psychological damage the pandemic is doing to people around me is this notion that they don't know tonight what they're going to do. Sorry, they don't know today what they're going to do tonight because everything changes constantly. And innovation requires a very agile mindset. And that's not just a cliche. It's, 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 it's an actual physical ability. And so um, if we wanted to, uh, to uh, make sure that we innovate in a coherent manner, we need to keep our minds constantly focused on what the benefit of innovation would be. And God knows there are enough crises around us to be able to find a reason to apply this innovation spirit. So I would, my, my, my view on this would be to identify one problem and to relentlessly go at it until we brought enough innovation. And innovation not in the sense of improvement, incremental improvement, innovation into complete new thinking. We, looked, we talked about, um, uh, about accounting before, about how we measure for impact. If we really want to construct a more just society, we're going to have to shift away from the fact that making money is the only way to manage success. And that shift is a monstrously important shift to make and incredibly difficult one too. So yeah, that's what I would wish to, to, to humanity around me. Stop thinking about short-term specialization. Let's talk about broad-term complexity. Great. So slaying cows, being agile. Sarah, what do you want to add? Um, I would suggest people are passionately dispassionate about the problem they're trying to solve. So be passionate about the problem, like really, as Andre said, like totally committed to the big problem you're trying to solve, but really dispassionate about the solutions. Don't be wedded to your old way of doing things or think you've tried it before, or that's a crazy idea. Often the craziest ideas or the ideas that you that are on the edges, the things that you come across by serendipity, the things that aren't the target, but are the things you discover on the way, that is often where the real innovation lies. Jeff, give me your two cents about this. Yeah, I mean, for me, the most important discussion I have with, with people trying to do this is, is exactly along the lines of what we just talked about, really having a discussion about what problem we're trying to solve, why are we trying to solve it, and what does a good solution look like? It's actually very, it's a very simple, exercise to get really focused on the problem rather than your commitment to a potential solution maybe too early and you know that's I think that's fundamentally the issue it's it's being problem focused and, and really being clear on, on that topic versus a particular technology that might get you there 
Great. Well, I can, can I add a final one, Jan? Which Please. is all in one, though. I'm doing it at the end so that no one can disagree with me. Don't, <laughs> I will disagree with you. Don't listen to the experts because the experts haven't solved it so far. So it's going to be someone who's not an expert who's going to solve it. That is my advice. I totally disagree. But anyway, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to our participants on behalf of myself and of Chatham House. And thank you to Chatham House too. It was great. And see you soon, hopefully. <laughs>